Vsauce, Kevin here. I'm gonna put this out with my fingers. Ow! Oh, fire! Fire activated my nociceptors. Pain is traveling up my nerves at 10 feet per second into ganglia and then my spinal cord where neurons process the signal and tell my brain there's damaging stimuli in my fingers. And I knew, I knew I had to drop the match because it hurt. That scientific explanation fits with Rene Descartes' bell ringer theory of pain. The harder your body pulls on the bell's hurt rope, the louder the pain alarm sounds in your brain. But if that's true, how could Scottish farmer John Mitson cut his hand off with a pocket knife and carry it half a mile to a neighbor's house? He said it was sheer survival and logic, and strangely, I didn't feel any pain. If a guy can do that, why does my finger still hurt from a lousy little match? How can we map exactly how the nervous system processes pain and then see fake placebos made of sugar trick it? Isn't it interesting that what hurts you can actually feel pleasurable to someone else? And we can even feel phantom pain in parts of the body that have been removed. Pain makes no sense, if you think about it. Pain is the oldest feeling we have. It predates love by millions of years. We need pain to protect us from the world, and it's also the bane of our existence. C.S. Lewis called pain God's megaphone, and Buddha considered life and pain inseparable. We seem to know everything about the mechanisms of pain and absolutely nothing about how to deal with it. We're in a constant quest to relieve pain, from crafting the way we live to avoid it, to relying on powerful chemical interventions and life-altering surgeries to eliminate it. But if we took all the pain away, what would we have left? Do we actually need pain to be who we are. Well, tolerating pain might actually prove you're human. In Dune, Paul Atreides places his hand inside a mysterious green box. The Reverend Mother channels her energy to subject Paul to intense, unbearable pain. If he removes his hand, he's pricked by a poison-tipped needle and dies. But if Paul can overcome the animalistic instinct to succumb to the pain, then he proves his humanity. It's the perfect example of the duality of pain, but instead of nature versus nurture, it's more like nature versus torture. Pain is humanity's original teacher. Painful sensations tell us what to do less of and what to do more of. According to Dr. Frank Vertasek, plants don't feel pain because they have no behavior to modify and the simplest organisms like worms don't use any judgment. Their behavioral responses are all pre-programmed, so they don't require instruction from pain. But complex animals like mammals, animals with higher cognition, need pain to survive. A caterpillar that loses a leg keeps on chugging and never even knows it happened. A gorilla that shatters a leg dies in the jungle. What was our first pain? That's easy, being born. Your head gets deformed to squeeze through openings that are way too small for it, which is uh, tough on the mom too. In terms of evolution, the severe pain of childbirth is probably an incentive to keep it short. We've even deliberately made childbirth hurt more to speed the whole thing up. The Cossacks of Central Asia held a mother's hand to a flame for the duration of labor. Paiute mothers fasted to starve their babies out. Klamath Indian mothers told their babies a rattlesnake would climb into the womb to bite them if they didn't come out. And the uh, strangest source of added birthing pain came from a tribe in northern Russia, which forced both mother and father to discuss details of their affairs with others during childbirth. But we're only born once, and mothers give birth maybe a few times in a lifetime. It's only a tiny fraction of life's pain.
As our cognition evolved, so did our pain, its frequency, its intensity, and its purpose. We feel the pain of loss when someone we love dies. We feel the pain of loneliness when a friendship or a romantic relationship ends. We even feel physical pain linked to our mental health, like the body pain that often manifests from depression. Managing pain and avoiding pain drives almost every decision we make physically and socially because we're sufficiently complex to understand that pain leads to suffering. And that link, the link between pain and suffering is everything, including the words for it. The Latin nervous means cord, sinew, bowstring, but by the 1500s, we understood nerves as vigor, fortitude, energy. Herophilus of Chalcedon dissected enough cadavers to know that there was a system inside us that generated and transmitted our sensations, but we had no real medical understanding of how the nervous system actually worked until pretty recently but we knew enough to use words that suggested we weren't entirely passive in the process. Pain could reveal not just suffering, but strength. Our initial response to pain is to completely freak out, even to the threat of pain. Suffering can happen even before the pain does. The most famous pain in human history is the meta-narrative of Jesus' crucifixion. He was likely nailed to the cross through the carpal tunnel a site which could support body weight through the unique strength of ligaments that bind the carpal bones. And the crucifixion of criminals was particularly torturous because it slices into the median nerve that bisects the arm and radiates pain through the hands, shoulders, and neck. But Jesus' suffering came before any of that even happened. While in the Garden of Gethsemane, after the Last Supper and before his arrest by the Romans, he underwent what's called the agony in the garden. He experienced such an intense terror of the pain and suffering he knew he was about to receive that he sweated blood. So let's recap. We've got two things here. The science of pain traversing the body and going into the brain and the science of what happens when it starts being processed. The first intervention was to eliminate pain in the course of applying medical knowledge we did have, like developing anesthesia for surgeries. In the early 1800s, we knew how to knock someone out. You bonk them on the head or drug them. The problem is we didn't know how long they'd be out, when they'd wake up, or if they'd wake up at all. The solution was recreational drug use. Hello, please hit that like button and let me thank HelloFresh for supporting Vsauce 2. Relieving hunger pains with delicious dinners has never been more convenient thanks to HelloFresh. Their seasonal ingredients are picked at peak ripeness and travel from the farm to your doorstep in less than seven days. They've got 40 recipes to choose from weekly with options for even the pickiest eaters, and it's 25% less expensive than takeout. I eat pretty much the same things for breakfast and lunch every day, so dinner is the time to inject much needed variety in my diet diet. And HelloFresh takes the guesswork out of deciding what to eat. And it's always a much better balanced meal than the two pan-fried hot dogs I'd probably eat on my own. So go to HelloFresh.com and use code 16Vsauce2 to get 16 free meals plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com and use code 16Vsauce2 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. Okay. Joseph Priestley, who discovered oxygen, synthesized nitrous oxide in 1772. It became known as laughing gas. Experiments used it to treat tuberculosis, but the British gentry organized laughing gas parties where they inhaled it and stumbled around like giggling idiots. The same thing happened with ether. Michael Faraday hosted ether parties called JAGs, and eventually, Someone noticed that when partygoers injured themselves while under the influence, they were not in pain. Its refinement for use in surgery came later. 
And the same was true for derivatives of cocaine, which was found to be an effective local anesthetic. Lidocaine, Novocaine, and all the other canes were developed as replacements for cocaine because uh, cocaine proved to be kind of addictive. Paracelsus, the magnet scientist who I mentioned in my Madness of Crowds video, dissolved opium extract in a solution. He called it laudanum, which literally means worthy of praise. There was morphine, which is seriously strong. The Dutch had a poppy paste called dupe, which is where we got the term dope. And in 1897, scientists at Bayer developed aspirin, so there was that. But until the middle of the 20th century, pain management was pretty much the same as it was in Julius Caesar's time. Before I explain what happened, consider that modern doctors generally have three ways to deal with a patient's pain. Eliminate the underlying cause, which is best, treat the pain itself, or alter the patient's perception of the pain. 80 years ago, that wasn't so clear. Throughout World War II, pain and suffering was documented on a grand scale across a range of cultures. But after the war, tens of millions were living with chronic pain. Some missing limbs, some with irreparably broken bodies, some with broken minds, some with nagging injuries that prevented them from resuming their past lives. We'd always dealt with pain, but now we had a lot of it. We didn't know what to do, and even the obvious pain in battle didn't always make sense. John Bonica is considered the founder of the discipline of pain medicine. He couldn't understand why three-fourths of the seriously wounded men he treated during the landing at Anzio did not request morphine, and some were even happy. Happy? How do you smile when your leg gets blown off? Bonica knew severe chronic pain himself. Before the war, he'd been a famous professional wrestler named the Masked Marvel, and as he aged, his body never forgave him. Bonica concluded that pain was not a simple question of will or temperament, and that it depended on things like mood, emotional status, cerebral functions, anxiety levels, and more and that analgesia or any medical intervention needed to respect the areas of life outside of pain. Medicine at that time did not respect the areas of life outside of pain. A 1956 article in Time magazine called the new wave of overly strong pain medications don't give a damn pills because they seemed to wipe out the personalities of too many who took them. Painkillers flooded the medical marketplace, and patients were demanding relief. At the same time, the same time, the most widely accepted way to deal with chronic pain was simply to sever the nerves connected to it, including the broad use of Antonio Eges Moniz's lobotomy, for which he won the Nobel Prize. The common practice was the ice pick method, where a long, thin metal pick was inserted above the eyeball and gouged around one's frontal lobe. It generally worked, but many lobotomy patients continued to report their chronic pain, just that they didn't care about it anymore. So the spectrum of dealing with pain in the 1950s was zombie pills or brain gouging. To make the situation worse, one phrase became increasingly common in medicine, malingerer, someone who exaggerates their pain to avoid the responsibilities of daily life. Doctors had to identify whether a patient's pain was even legitimate before figuring out how to treat it, and the pharmaceutical industry was just exploding. Pain management was a total mess, which turned out to be a good thing. In 1965, Ronald Melzack and Patrick Wall processed the complexity of it all to formulate the gate control theory of pain. In rejecting Descartes' simplistic bell ringer theory, they wrote, pain is not a fixed response to hurtful stimulus. Its perception is modified by our past experiences, our expectations, and more subtly, by our culture. 
pain, we now believe, refers to a category of complex experiences, not a single sensation produced by a specific stimulus. Their theory came 20 years after the conclusion of humanity's greatest global sustained bout of pain. And it was just in time for pain to get political. After the war, the desire to alleviate pain and suffering led to sweeping welfare states that could take care of the needy. Governments were faced with impossible questions. Whose pain is worthy of support? Is all pain real? How much pain should we expect a normal person to endure? How do you define standards for what hurts? In the United States, the pain standard had been pretty grim. In 1937, the Supreme Court judge Learned Hand wrote in Taberge v. United States that a man may have to endure discomfort or pain and not be totally disabled. Much of the best work of life goes on under such disabilities. Translation, suck it up, buttercup. Yeah, then everything changed with Rosie Page. In 1963, the Supreme Court heard Page v. Celebrezzi, which detailed Rosie's plight with pain she claimed was a result of her job at a manufacturing plant. Doctors were split. How real was her pain, and to what degree does the patient decide? The ruling shifted the entire concept of pain and suffering. If pain is real to the patient, the disability entitles the person to statutory benefits. If pain is real to the patient, the subjective was now worth at least as much as the objective. And is that a good thing? To someone in intense pain that even Dr. House can't diagnose, absolutely yes. To a doctor who must decide whether a patient can be prescribed opiates without a significant risk of developing abuse? Not really. And uh, that's where we're at with pain, in a push and pull of the real and the perceived, and in a race with science to figure it all out. Pain is a physical sensation and an emotion and a problem that 75 years ago would have been addressed by an ice pick through the eye socket now encompasses acute treatment, palliative care, and a range of mental health interventions. But we still have the same questions we've always had. Should childbirth be painful and natural, or should we administer epidural analgesia? How much does giving aid to the suffering actually encourage them to not get better? How important is pain and suffering to the human experience? Humanity has so much back pain because our spines are designed to be horizontal, parallel to movement on the ground. We got upright so fast that our bones haven't caught up. Childbirth hurts so much because our cranial size increased so rapidly that women's bodies haven't had time to accommodate our big baby melons. And pain? Seven million years our direct ancestors and ancient ancestors just had to bear it. It's really only in the last 100 that we've even faced the prospect of being able to walk into a drugstore to relieve it. Now, we don't know what to do. We know that pain leads to suffering, but we aren't clear on how much it has to. In the 1962 film Lawrence of Arabia, T.E. Lawrence stuns the other soldiers by extinguishing a match with his fingers. One of them tries it and shrieks that it hurts, then demands to know what the trick is. To which Lawrence replies, the trick. Is not minding that it hurts. And as always, thanks for watching.